Good afternoon, and welcome to today for this special occasion. Uh, I'm Jia Zhang, Dean of the School of Biomedical Informatics at UT Health. As you know, we are gathered here on this uh, auspicious occasion to formally launch the John P. Glasser Health Informatics Society. Many of you know our school well, but for those who do not know, please give me a few minutes to tell you what we're doing here. Uh, we are the School of Biomedical Informatics, one of the six schools at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, which is one of the 14 campuses of UT system. UT Health, that's what we call our university here, is the most comprehensive health science universities in the state of Texas with six schools. And our School of Biomedical Informatics is the only biomedical informatics program at a school in the country. And I can tell you today we are the biggest one in Texas, of course, in the nation and in the world. Uh, before I hand this over to John, uh, I will tell you a little bit about uh, the stuff we're doing here by the students and faculty. Uh, we all know that uh, information technology is changing everything. And for healthcare, we just started that uh, comprehensively about 10 years ago-ish. So with the wide adoption of electronic medical records, today I think almost all hospitals, 97%, have computer system for your medical records. 10 years ago, it was about 10, 15%. So that is a dramatic growth. On the other hand, the cost to sequence one person's genome, it was $100 million 15 years ago. That's enough to buy an Airbus 320. Today, the cost is equivalent to your brand new iPhone 7 Plus, $1,000. Okay, it can be done in a matter of hours. So a huge amount of data. And on the other hand, the smartphone you have, like iPhone or Android or whatever, is so powerful. iPhone 6, the not most recent one, is literally five or more times more powerful than the fastest supercomputer in 1975, the Cray whatever model. That one, in today's value, would cost you $35 million. And it was used for the simulation of rockets, all kind of things. And today, you have in your pocket a powerful machine that can do pretty much everything that you can imagine. And 30% of the world population had smartphones last year. By 2020, 80% of them will have a smartphone. Just imagine the possibilities of there. So here in the school, we are, doing, we are educate, educating students who can become future scientists who make more discoveries. We also educate professionals who can go out to have the hospitals, the patients, and everybody to improve their health and make diagnosis and develop smart treatment. And also, we develop actual products that can be used in the real world to solve real world problems. So that's our school. As, as you, you could imagine with the explosion of information technology and data in healthcare and other industries, we have seen a huge growth of our enrollment. So literally over the past three years, our student body has almost been tripled from 125 to 304 today. And our faculty size has also been almost tripled. Okay, so that's a huge growth for everybody. So that's our school. Now let me come back to why we are here today. So today we will be honoring Dr. John P. Glasser, who so generously agreed to let us use his name to establish the John P. Glasser Health Information Society. The purpose of the society is to recognize the superstars in informatics, both in the applied world and in academic research. John 
has a PhD in informatics and has long been a leader in the, in the field of health IT and informatics. Uh, at this time, he is currently the CDO VP and executive cabinet member of a Suno Corporation. And among his many affiliations, John was the founding chairman of the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives and the past president of the, of the Health Information Management System Society, or HIMSS. HIMSS attracts more than 40,000 attendees almost every year over the past three years. It's a big event, and John basically grew up with HIMSS many years back. So today is a huge, huge organization. Uh, John also has served on many boards, including the eHealth Initiative, the National Alliance for Health Information Technology, and the American Medical Informatics Association. John is a fellow of HIMSS, uh, CHIME, American College of Medical Informatics, and uh, most recently, he was a fellow, he was a senior advisor for ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, that basically laid the blueprint for health IT in the United States. So, John, please join me. So as the Dean of the School of Biomedical Informatics, I want to formally recognize you as a founding member of the John P. Glasser Society. Thank you, sir. Great pleasure. And, and now you are inducted <laughs> as the first member of the John P. Glasser Society. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now, John, I want to ask you to do the honor of introducing the first recipient of the John P. Glasser Society. Terrific. Thank you, Shaoji. Anyway, uh, thank all of you. It's a, obviously an honor and a pleasure to be here. And uh, I was just thinking, Michael Phelps has a lot of gold medals, but he didn't have one of these yet. So <laughs> I'm sure he's sort of uh, relishing the opportunity to get one at this point. Um, first of all, I thank all of you for being here, and less so for me and more so for Ivo Nelson, who I'm about to uh, introduce. You know, normally I don't follow scripts, uh, but I thought given the importance of this occasion and my respect for Ivo, as much as I will tease him from time to time, that I would stay on script, although I'm not quite sure what the script says. So we'll look forward to, <laughs> look forward to that. Um, yeah, the, the, the basic is the award, the named after me, uh, and the society was created to recognize uh, innovators in the field of health uh, informatics and provide education, collaboration, and networking opportunities for the broader community of health informatics uh, professionals and students. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we are honoring uh, the celebrated, uh, and I know he'll blanch at this, but he'll take it anyway, celebrated health information technology icon, son of a gun, who knew? Uh, Ivo D. Nelson, uh, who was named the first uh, recipient of the John P. Glasser Health Informatics uh, Innovator Award. Now, by way of background, uh, Ivo spent, uh, I guess, his first decade uh, in the social services and construction industries uh, before he began his career in healthcare at uh, Perot uh, Systems, where he was an early proponent of the technology's power to drive uh, clinical transformation. Now, the idea that healthcare systems could use the technology to improve patient care uh, led to the formation of HealthLink Corporation uh, back in 1992. Uh, and by the time IBM had acquired it uh, in 2005, uh, HealthLink had become the largest privately held provider focused healthcare technology consulting firm uh, in the world. In 2009, uh, Ivo co founded with uh, some colleagues here uh, Encore Health Resources to assist uh, healthcare organizations in mining the business intelligence that they had accrued after decades of process uh, and technology improvements. Now, since its founding, uh, Encore has been one of the fastest growing health IT services companies uh, in the industry and was named by Modern Healthcare as one of the uh, best places to work for five years uh, in a row. Uh, and Encore was acquired uh, in 2014 by Quintiles. And so I have another successful uh, company, and there's more to come. Uh, he's now chairman and CEO of Next Wave Health, uh, which is an investment firm 
that facilitates success among startups and early stage companies uh, by providing a comprehensive package of experience, tools, IP, and relationships that facilitate uh, long-term success. I'd also like to you know, sort of point out along the way that uh, Ivo has served as a mentor to a very large number of people in the field, including myself. Uh, I had more than one occasion where I sought the advice of my colleague Ivo, and uh, I was quite wise advice, so I appreciate that, Ivo, uh, along the way. So in addition to that, uh, Ivo has uh, three companies that are currently in the portfolio uh, of Next Wave Connect. Uh, one is Next Wave Connect, which is a virtual ecosystem of communities focused on current topics and challenges uh, specific to the healthcare industry. Global Healthcare Alliance, uh, which is a value-based reimbursement software and services company. Uh, and Next Wave Advisors, which is a high-end uh, boutique advisory firm. Now, over the past several years, uh, Ivo has worked with Med Synergies, Health Post, Encore, and Healthcare DataWorks, all of which have had successful exits. So in the parlance of Texas, uh, <coughs> Ivo's uh, first rodeo of the healthcare IT, um, sort of uh, interesting taming of the animal as it were, uh, took place a long time ago and he's been successfully riding bulls uh, ever since. Uh, he was named, <laughs> it's a great line, Josh, I don't know where you got it, but it's a great line. <laughs> I do remember that. seeing Ivo in the mud with a bunch of clowns jumping around him trying to get him from getting hurt. <laughs> anyway, after two seconds on the bull, well done, Ivo. There you go. Uh, anyway, I'm back to being serious here because we should be serious given the individual in front of us, his accomplishments, and the nature of this award. Anyway, he was named to the HIMSS uh, 50 and 50 uh, list, which acknowledges the top 50 contributors uh, to the healthcare IT industry over the last 50 years. Uh, he's received the Lifetime Achievement Award from CHIME, uh, the HIMSS Leadership Award, and the prestigious Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Uh, and now we'll have uh, one more notch uh, to add to your belt, my friend. Uh, so Ivo, would you please join me at the podium here. Congratulations, Ivo. So, um, so as, the, uh, uh, as a founding member of the John P. Glasser uh, Society here, uh, I induct you into the society. You still haven't passed the exam we require, but we'll let you finish that up after uh, the, the time here. They're hazing. No, no, we're not going to make you run naked around the building or anything like that. But uh, anyway, stay tuned. You've got to pass the exam first. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, I want to uh, hear it accord you. Here's the Informatics Award for 2016. So let me place this on you. There you go, sir. Make sure that hair doesn't fall off. And of course, uh, so, I on behalf of myself and a lot of people, obviously the people in this room, but a lot of people who are, are not here, thank you for all that you've done. It's a great you, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. It's a Where's Judy, our organizer? Judy, can you start the PowerPoint? Can you start the PowerPoints? No. I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, first off, I do want to thank Judy. She organized all this. She is like a dog with a bone, let me tell you. You are not going to get away from her. So thank you, Judy, for everything you do. Also, thank you, John. Uh, when when I, uh, Judy set up a call, wouldn't tell me why, a few months ago, I kept, you know, fantasizing as to why we'd want to have this, this call with all these important people, particularly with John Glasser on the phone. We don't call me until I had won this award. It really shocked me. <laughs> it really did surprise me, okay? Uh, but it was meaningful because of the organization that Jaji has helped build, uh, being the prestigious organization that it is, and particularly because it was named after uh, John Glasser, who has been, I think if you really look at health IT in the industry and people who are relevant in the industry, you've got, you know, all kinds of icons out there, okay, and then there's John Glasser. He's really a cut above everybody else. So John, this is, uh, this is meaningful to me for a lot of reasons, but particularly because of you, okay? Um, I have no PowerPoints. We're just going to talk, okay? Because I've got, <laughs> yeah, there's my PowerPoint. <laughs> See, ignore the screen, okay? Uh, I'm going to start really with, with kind of my early days as an entrepreneur. This was this talk was kind of, I think, uh, advertised as being commercializing innovation. And 
uh, and that's only because I couldn't really figure out anything else to title it. It's, it's, you know, there'll be a twist about commercializing innovation, but a lot of it's going to be about being an entrepreneur, leading companies, you know, and, and taking innovations actually through a cycle of commercialization in, in some way. Okay, and, and sometime back, uh, I ran into this lady in the red dress over here named Tammy Clean. And Tammy, uh, she, basically, she writes books, okay, and, and helps you get published. Because I was thinking, you know, I've done all these things, maybe I should write a book about them. And I put an outline together. It's called the 12-step program for entrepreneurs. <laughs> and I, I went through the outline, and I just, it just, something about it just didn't quite feel right. It's kind of a how-to book on, you know, how to, how to build companies. And the more I looked at it, the more it looked like a whole bunch of other books that other people had written. And I realized I hadn't really done, gone deep enough, you know. I hadn't peeled the onion back enough. So mentally, I kind of went through a process and took the 12, threw them in the trash, So I'm going to start over again, okay? And I have five things we're going to talk about today. I'm going to start with how I got there back in more early days, because John was right in his intro in that I didn't start off in this health IT space. I actually started off. As a, as a guy who grew up in Waco, Texas, moved out to California, chasing a girl, actually. Sorry, it's a, she only, only lasted about two months, okay. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I was stuck out in California and I had to have a job, I had to have something to do, and I couldn't figure out how I was going to make money. It's an expensive place to live, okay. So I figured what people, people think, I mean, people in California, what they think about Texans is that you must be able to swing a hammer and build things, okay, because that's what Texans do. So I went to the hardware store, it was in my early 20s, okay, went to the hardware store, bought a nail belt, bought a hammer, and I just started walking around to construction sites. Finally found, you know, some folks that would take me on. I looked like a construction guy, you know, kind of had a beard, you know, it was kind of burly. I wore a flannel shirt, had blue jeans and boots on, you know. Uh, they picked me up, and the first job they gave me was go build some sawhorses. Well, frankly, I'd never had a construction job ever. I had no idea how to build a sawhorse, okay? But I got out there, and I was working, working, and I, he had a big stack of lumber that I could work with, old used lumber, okay? And I was cutting the corners and trying to put it together. It wasn't ever right or level. The angles of things were never, it just didn't come together. The foreman, at the end of the day, was leaving, and I had the lights up. Okay, because I was going to work until this thing was done and it was getting dark. And the next morning when the foreman came back in, I was there before he showed up, 6 o'clock in the morning, still trying to build these sawhorses. And when he left that night, I still had the lights up. I'm still trying to build these sawhorses. <laughs> and by then, this pile of wood was like this tall of all these, you know, Wasted wood from everything. He finally just went, okay, I'm gonna, come on, I'm going to give you something. He realized, okay, I didn't really have any idea what I was doing. But I was the first guy in. I was the first guy, last guy out at night. And I'd never give up. So I started, he taught me, basically, this little company taught me everything about, they were remodeling in the, in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, okay, down in Palo Alto, taught me everything about construction. So I started my own business. This is my first venture into entrepreneurism. I put a two-line ad in the Palo Alto paper. It said, handyman, $10 an hour. That was it. Okay? I had more work than I could do. Really hard things, too, by the way, like hanging a ceiling fan. <laughs> I'm putting in a doggy door. Finally, these Silicon Valley companies started calling me, and there was one in particular that took me on almost full time. I mean, they were consuming everything I did, doing even more complicated things like hanging whiteboards <laughs> or hanging coat racks, okay? Sometimes they would ask me to come down to the Xerox room and fill in for the Xerox lady, and the secretaries come down and give you things to copy, okay? And my job was to copy them and at some point get them back to the secretary's desk. So, tough job, okay? What I did was, says I'm going to set a quality standard beyond what any other copy guy has ever done, ever. Okay? And so I started making the copies, and my, 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 my objective was D 
to get those copies back on the secretary's desk before she got back to her desk. Because I realized was that these secretaries didn't go straight back to their desk. They wandered around. They took the longest route possible to get there, OK? And by the time they got to their desk, bam, it was there. When I'd go in to hang somebody's coat rack, I didn't just hang the coat rack, but I'd say, can I clean your printer, please, while I'm here? OK? Finally, one day, and this is, I'm getting to the important part of the story, trust me, OK? Finally, one day, I got called in to the CEO's office, Joe Zilakovich. Remember that name, Joe Zilakovich, because I'm going to come back to it, OK? CEO of this big telecom company. Now, keep in mind, you know, I'm not, I'm the lowest level guy in there. I knew I was the lowest level guy in there because one day, one of the copies that I was asked to make was coming from payroll, and they had everybody's salary in the entire company, OK? So I looked at it, you know, it's like you're not supposed to do this, but I'm kind of like, <laughs> I wonder how much all my friends are making and everything. CEO was top, had the top salary. I got to the bottom back page, thousands of employees, and Ivo Nelson was the last name on the sheet. Lowest paid guy in the entire company. And I'm being asked to come in to meet with the highest paid guy in the company. Joe you know. I was scared, really scared. So I go up there, I thought, man, what'd I do, you know, to flirt with somebody? Did I break somebody's printer, you know, what'd I do? So I'm going into, you know, yeah, these things work, okay. You go to the secretary's office, it leads you into another office, it leads you into another office, that gets you into this big, huge boardroom where the CEO is going to meet me. It's just he and I in this big room sitting down at the end of a table. And he says, Ivo, you got a reputation around here. You know, what are you doing with your life? Well, nobody ever asked me that before. I'm like, well, Mr. Zelikovich, I'm, I'm making a go of it, you know. I've kind of got my little business, you know. We can do this. He's like, he just stopped me midstream. He said, Ivo, you're wasting your life. And let me tell you what you need to do. And he started walking me through a process. He says, you need to go get a college degree. If I was you, I'd do something in technology because that's the future. And you need to learn about business. If you've got time and the money, get your MBA. Really a 15-minute conversation. I walked out of his office. I swear, there were angels. In the background, I had just met with God, okay? <laughs> Unbelievable. Because I really want you to let this sink in for a minute, okay? You've got the guy who makes the most amount of money in the entire company taking a few minutes out of his busy day to meet with the lowest level guy in the entire company. Think about the ripple. Because when I walked out of the office a few weeks later, I packed up my bags and I followed his program to a T. I mean, really. I did exactly what he told me to do. I came back to Waco, helped my parents build a house, went to Baylor University, got a degree in business with a technology focus. One of the things he told me to do is go to work for a company for a while that's got a good training program. I went to work for EDS and spent five or six years at EDS and went through their entire training program and then started down the entrepreneurial journey of starting companies, okay? So one man, one man took a few minutes out of his day for somebody who thought he was probably a loser, okay? It's a ripple. That 15 minutes probably has created thousands of jobs because of the inspiration that he gave me. So I'm not going to go into what's happened between that conversation and like me standing up here right now. You don't want to hear all the gory details. <laughs> but I am going to tell you five things that I've learned, okay, as you go through. Five things that I think are important to anybody who's going to be involved in business, maybe in life, okay. First off, Innovation, when you think about innovation, 
it starts with the idea, right? You got to have an idea. So there's two things I'm going to tell you about that. One is uh, Dana Sellers, who's sitting right up there, and I have been working together for a long time. Okay. <laughs> And we'd already gone through one company with HealthLink, okay? So when you talk about the idea, one of the things that we did before we started Encore is we got on airplanes, and in about a month, I think, we met with over 150 executives from almost every metropolitan area of the United States. Now, these are, these are meetings we could get because we'd already established relationships, okay? And the conversation went something like this. We're going to start a company. We think it's going to be kind of in this range somewhere. Can you help me? Can you help me with the idea? By the time we had connected 150 conversations together, we knew exactly what the company needed to do. Because we'd gone out to real people who are real buyers who really need work and really need help, OK? So that's one thing. On the idea, you've got to have somebody that's going to buy it. Now, as funny as it sounds that I mentioned that, I meet with a lot of entrepreneurs all the time. They generally start with the idea. They want to go spend the money and then go find the customers. You know, it's really not the way it should work. Okay, talk to your customers. The second thing I'm going to tell you is going to make you, if, you know, those of you who have, you know, are, are, are trying to build companies or you wished you had, okay, I'm going to tell you something that's specific to the healthcare IT space because that's about all I know. It's so dirt simple. It's going to make you feel stupid. You're going to hear this and you're going to go, if I had known that, I'd have a Porsche, I'd have five cars all over the world, five houses all over the world, you know. If you know, told me this Ivo 20 years ago, it would have changed my life. They got you set up? That is this, in the healthcare IT space, the government and how the government's going to spend money drives everything. Okay, if you're going to start a company and you're trying to operate within a circle, if that circle is going to get bigger, everybody wins. In the healthcare space, that's just the way it works. Okay, you got to understand and be able to predict regulatory and legislative changes before they're made, like several years before they're made, because you have to have your company ready to take advantage of it. Well, how do you do that? You know, how do you know what the government's going to do? Well, there are several things you can do. The easiest thing is just to call John Glasser <laughs> and say, can you go create a law that does this? Because he is, like, keep me, he's, he's like the godfather of health care, so if he goes, tells Obama, go do this, he's going to do it. That's the easy way to do it. The reality is, I give it your best shot, okay? But, you know, the idea is if you can find something where it's going to be, and it's, it really is, it's a lot, it really is easier than you can imagine if you can, if you can predict the what, even better if you can predict the when, okay? Number two. Now, number two is obvious to everybody, anybody that's ever had anything to do with business, okay? And if you go to the bookstore, you're going to see a million things written about this book. Number two is focus. So I'm going to give you, this whole thing is going to be story, real, real world stories of things that, that I've experienced, okay? So one of the things I learned at HealthLink was we started off with walking into somebody's office like David Bradshaw sitting right here and saying, hey, David, what's on your mind? Well, David's got a lot of things on his mind, okay? He starts talking. You're saying, well, we can do that. Okay, and so next thing you know, you walk out of the office. He says, okay, I'll, I'll take that. Okay, you walk out of the office, then you go, how are we going to do that? Okay, and then you just kind of hire smart people and you go figure it out. Problem is, after you've done that a hundred times, you've got, you're doing all kinds of things. Okay, there's no focus. So I had a, a, a very bad year at HealthLink where we lost some business to a strategy company that was up here, you know, I think it was like, Anderson Consulting or somebody like that with the big boys and they were selling strategy and then they sold down to the CIO and won the IT strategy and then they won the implementation we got squeezed out of there and I'm like what you know I hate to lose 
I got to get into that strategy business. So I went out and acquired three companies, okay, boutique consulting firms that did strategy, facilities planning, strategic market plans, and stuff like that. It was a nightmare. <laughs> Different cultures, people didn't like each other. I mean, it was just like. So one day, I'd hired one of these principals. One of those companies, the two people didn't even like, they hated each other. I didn't even know that, okay? They hated each other. We'd go to meetings and they'd be literally facing the wall off. They wouldn't even look at each other. It was, it was bizarre, okay? So one of them, a PhD nurse, I said, we need, we need to really define what our solutions are going to be. So this idea of a solution, okay, you're a consultant, you need solutions. So she went off and did that, invited me to a meeting, and I walked into the meeting, and we had this, in the, in the conference, we had this whiteboard, went all the way wall to wall. She had black ink across the whole thing, okay? One list after another list after another list. And I counted them up and said, there's more solutions here than we have employees in the company. Literally, there are more solutions than we had people. How are we supposed to do that? In the meantime, her partner was in the back facing the wall because he hated her, you know. So anyway, he's dynamics going on. I mean, it's just like right there, the defining moment. It was like, okay, this is just wrong. These guys have written these books, good to great. The GE philosophies, you need to be the best at one or two things, okay, or don't do it. Hit me like a, like a brick. I cleared the room. Fired the guy who was facing the wall. Eventually fired her too, okay? And totally realigned the company to say, we're gonna do one thing, not 500 things. We're gonna do one thing, and we're gonna do it better than anybody does. It. So we redo the marketing department, everything, every person that we hired, every conference that we went to, Everything was pointing to that one thing. You go ask somebody on the East Coast what we did, ask somebody on the West Coast, the same words came out of their mouth, okay? We had one client, one customer, one stakeholder that we sold to. Guess what happened? The company took off. It just took off. Focus. Let me tell you. It's unfortunate we have to learn it the hard way like I did, but it is super important. Third, judgment. Again, sounds obvious, right? You gotta make good decisions, okay? What I've realized is that almost anybody that's built a significant business will tell you that there are defining moments and key decisions that get made that are everything. And the, the leaders that can make those decisions are the ones that make it, okay? Let me give you some examples that are more tied to a, a mentor of mine. Many of you have heard the name Rod Canyon who founded Compaq Computers, okay? By the, and by the way, uh, there's actually a documentary out on Compaq called Silicon Cowboys. Really recommend you go see it, you know? Because what these guys did was phenomenal. You think about it, a company that goes from zero to 100 million in the first year, year four they hit a billion. That's fast growth, that's the fastest growing as you can, is, uh, in fact, they were the fastest growing company for a long time, okay? I had lunch with Rod, about a year ago, and he was talking about the book he was writing. He, he didn't know about the movie at that time. He was talking about the book that he was writing around key decisions that he made at Compaq, okay? But one of those decisions was IBM was coming out with a computer. Compaq had their clone that they come out. It was IBM compatible, okay? Now IBM is coming out with their computer they decided to do a proprietary, what they call it, bus, proprietary architecture. So the nerds in the room can understand what that means. Rod had to decide, are we going to continue to follow IBM and their proprietary, or are we going to go with open systems and standards? And they made a decision to aggregate the industry and get everybody to come up with standards and go with open systems. In the face of the big bad boy in the industry, IBM, which nobody felt they, anybody could compete with them, okay? Well, when IBM had made this announcement, sales dried up. I mean, literally, nobody was buying. They were all waiting for IBM. Key decision, two key decisions that Rod had to make. One was, do we keep manufacturing computers? Nobody's buying, okay? The decision was, yes. They're gonna bank on IBM failing and IBM missing their deadlines. Here's the funny thing. 
They kept making computers. They didn't have a place to store them. So they got semis, loaded up with semis, and they rented hotel parking lots around town and had these semis all parked in the back of these hotels full of compact computers. Okay. So one thing that happened is IBM missed their, missed their deadline. Bam. They pulled up to the semis. The floodgates opened, you know, and compact sales started going through the roof. The second problem was IBM turned out not to be compatible with IBM. <laughs> IBM wasn't IBM compatible, you know, and the compact was, okay. But these were decisions. These were thoughtful decisions that were made, okay. We had the same in other companies that I've worked with, you know, really key decisions. One of the best decisions that we made was to push decision making out to people who are close to clients, okay. D Dana has told me before she thinks that's that decision was maybe the most important decision that caused the company to grow as fast as it did. Empower people to make decisions when they're in the heat of battle because we had this, uh, we were up, you know, on these, one of these kind of sit on the mountain, do your, do your annual strategy sessions, says we want to be 100% referenceable. Like every single client out there is going to be referenceable, not even one's not going to be referenceable. Well, how do you do that if you don't have your people who you're holding accountable for that referenceability to make decisions. Culturally, it's hard. It's hard to give up that kind of control when you're going from small to big company, okay? But we did it. And in fact, in 13 years, we were 100% referenced. We didn't have a single unreferenceable client in 13 years. We didn't have a single dollar of bad debt in 13 years. Unheard of, okay? But a lot of it was because of an absolutely uncompromising, uncompromising attitude about the service we're going to provide to clients and the fact we're going to leave every single one of them satisfied, okay? Fourth? <laughs> Losing count here. <laughs> the accountants in the room can keep me, you know, up here, okay? Fourth is culture. Whew! Man, what a lesson culture is all about. So. I was actually on the uh, Christus board at one time. Christus is a big Catholic multi-hospital organization. Uh, the nuns are very prominent. They're not running the organizations anymore, but they're very prominent on the board. So I'm on the board, and they open every meeting with a reflection. They call it like a reflection. Sometimes it's a prayer, sometimes it's a poem. Sometimes it's a reading of some kind, and they rotate that, okay? So they rotate, and it came to my turn to do the reflection. That really stressed me out, let me tell you. Really did. I mean, trust me, I've given speeches and talks to world leaders, I've, princes, kings, uh, ministers of health, you know, audiences of thousands before. Doing that reflection... Kept me up at night for a week. I had no idea what I was going to do, you know. And these nuns are there. I'm going to go to hell. <laughs> so I finally came up with a passage uh, from the prophet and, and read that as my reflection. I got past it. But it was a huge takeaway, okay, a huge takeaway, that these people start every meeting, every board meeting, they start with a reminder of what they're all about, with a reminder that there's a mission here, there's a business that has to support the mission, okay? But it's all about the mission. So I came back and got our executives together and said, we're gonna start every meeting now with a reflection on our core values. We had the core values up on the wall, everybody carried a little card around with them, you know. I said, we're gonna start every meeting and we're gonna talk about one of the values. Pick one, pick one. We're going to talk about it. Did we do a good job here? Where did we fail? We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, maybe five minutes, okay? But we're going to do that in every meeting. And for years, every meeting we had, we talked about a core value. You know, did we do what was right for the client? Did we spend money like we would if it was our own? You know, these were all core values that we had. We would open board meetings with a discussion of a core value. One of the board meetings I remember going to said, let's talk about the core value. 
Uh, one of our board members was the ex-chief financial officer at Compaq. He pulled out his wallet, pulled out the card, and said, I'd like to pick one. I thought, that's cool. Okay. Unfortunately, when IBM acquired us, they weren't so much into that, you know, <laughs> whatever. Okay. Uh, but, and then, and then there was a, a, a second thing that we did. Let me see, back up. There was actually a series of small things that made me realize that culture is really defined based on, again, a ripple from the top, okay? Early in my career, in my EDS days, when I'd get on an airplane sometimes, and I'd be walking down the aisle, going through first class, I'd see all these big shots in there. And I'd say in my head going, wow, someday I can sit up in first class, you know. Someday I'll be a big shot too, you know. And I'd go back to my coach seat. seat. Years later, you know, I'm waiting for a flight with my first class ticket. You know, because you get enough miles, you get upgraded, okay? We didn't really buy first class, but you always get upgraded because how much you flew. And there were other employees that were on the same flight. And I reflected back on that day when I walked through first class and saw these big shots and thought, you know, what am I doing? So I went over to the lowest paid person that was on that flight and said, give me your ticket. Took the ticket. Gave her my ticket, okay? She's like, what? I'm, I, I'm flying first class? You never flown first class ever, okay? Yeah, have fun. I didn't really care, no that big a difference. Every time I flew from then on, I would take the ticket of the employee and exchange the ticket. One day, I'm flying with Dana. Dana goes over and swaps her ticket with one of the employees. And then one of the other managers, I noticed, was swapping his ticket with one of the employees. It wasn't a corporate policy. They just said, let's show some respect. Just because you're the CEO, just because you're a senior executive, that doesn't mean you're any better than anybody else, okay? That's culture, right? We went to every funeral of an employee. For a long time, it was Dana and I going to the funerals. And one of the few things I realized is one is usually appreciative, okay? It was very simple. Go in, sit in the back of the room, don't make a big deal, let the family mourn, okay? At funeral, leave. But just show your presence. Show your respect. Now, what I didn't realize is these people don't die in Dallas, Texas. They're like in Fred, Texas, you know. <laughs> They're like, you take a flight, you take another flight, you know, you hitchhike for 15 miles to get to where you got to go, you know. So it turned out these were really time-consuming things to do. But again, it was culture, right? It reflects back on culture. It's a message you really want to send to the organization. And as business leaders, it's like, you have to you, have to, you can't just talk about it like we, like we did when we opened executive meetings. You have to do it. You really have to do it. You know. That's four. Five. And this is the last one. Okay. You got to have fun. You got to have fun. Okay. Life's just too darn short to spend all your time at work and not have fun. Okay. I'll give you an example. Okay, we were getting acquired by IBM. And uh, so, you know, IBM hires all these big shot uh, lawyers, you know. They had external counsel and internal counsel. They had the law firm in Manhattan. We go to one of the final meetings, go up the elevator forever, okay, finally get out, walk into this room. It's got one of these board tables. It's as big as a football field. And, uh, and I go up to the window. And I look out the window, and I'm looking down on the Empire State Building. When I was a little boy, how many people here old, and old, old enough to know that when you, were, when you were a little kid, Empire State Building, that was the dope, man. That was cool stuff, Empire State Building, you know. I'm looking down on the Empire State Building. I'm thinking, wow, what's this Waco boy doing here, you know? There were five of us in this meeting, Dana and I, friend, a good friend of mine, Joe Boyd, uh, our lawyer and our CFO. They had 25 
on their side of the table. You can imagine it's 25 of these thousand dollar an hour lawyers and then five, you know, rednecks basically <laughs> over on this side. So we got there early one morning. We went over their side of the table. We lowered all their chairs down as far as they go. <laughs> and we raised all our chairs up. So they come in and they're like this. <laughs> you know, we're like. <laughs> I don't know if they thought that was funny or not, but I did. <laughs> yeah, particularly our lawyer, you know, they had, they had these, our lawyer was from Des Moines, Iowa, you know. I, I swear the guy just came off of a farm, a farm to come to this meeting, you know. So, having fun matters. Work-life balance, you know, uh, I kind of came to the conclusion that I don't believe in work-life balance. I, I believe in life. You spend so much time working in your life that you really need to make work a part of your life. Really, if you've got the kind of job where you think you have to split the two up, maybe you got the wrong job. You know, maybe you need a job where your life is your life, okay? And it's a little blurred between what's work and what's not work. I'm almost done. The only thing I'm going to mention before I close is this. I have had a chance to travel the world. Particularly when, I, when we got acquired by IBM, I went to so many countries doing health care seminars, helping their internal people develop strategies for their countries. It really gave me a world perspective. And here we are in this political season, right, where it feels like the United States is getting trashed a little bit, like we've lost our edge, and China and all these other companies are kicking our ass. And let me tell you, as a guy that has been out there, okay, if you want to innovate, if you want to be an entrepreneur, there is no better place than right here in the United States of America. By far. Everywhere I go, whether it's Houston or Dallas or Los Angeles, there's incubators, there's accelerators, there's, there's people there to help entrepreneurs get started with advice, with money, in all kinds of ways. There is no shortage of innovation. There's no shortage in ent entrepreneurs. And we live in an environment that is conducive to anybody who decides they want to go down that path to be successful in this country, far better than anywhere else, okay? So don't listen to Trump. Don't listen to Hillary. Don't listen to Johnson, you know. Anybody that wants to do it, they can be successful here. I'm going to close with this, okay? Joe Zilakovich. Joseph Lukovich took 15 minutes out of his day to change my life. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to do that, did he? Before you put your pillow, your head on your pillow tonight to go to bed, you know, ask yourself, are you Joseph Lukovich? You know, have you done a little bit? Have you taken a little bit of time out of your day to make a difference in somebody's life? The last thing, my trainer is here, Sarah, okay? She starts each one of our uh, uh, exercise workouts and our yoga with a prayer, and she ends every one with this. Namaskar. Thank you. <clears throat> oh. Hold on. So next up, you got one final speaker, Dr. Robert Murphy, Associate Dean of Applied Informatics at UT Health School of Biomedical Informatics. Thank you, Bob. Thank you again. And actually, I'm not speaking. All I'm doing, I have one important function, and that is, first of all, to thank Mr. Ivo Nelson. And Dr. John Glasser for uh, helping us found this beautiful society. It's lived for years and years. And now I'd like to invite you to join me, myself, Dr. Zhang, the faculty and students of the School of Biomedical Informatics, to uh, walk across the hall for a reception in the honor for Ivo Nelson, the first member of the John Glasser Society. Thank you very much.